This is how we do. Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. <laughs> And I didn't tell them that we were live, but we are. And tonight, we are going to be checking out this Raspberry Pi 3 as a Plex media server. Now, last so week, good. we set it up. Last week, we installed yes. it. Sasha and I built it. And uh, she's here. She's just over across the room, way over there. Um, we've got it connected. We've got a USB flash drive plugged into it. We're going to learn how it works, how to use it, how to actually access our media. We're going to learn all about it. We're going to see it live, in action, right here on Category 5 tonight. Stick around. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, Plex, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Cat5.tv slash IAIB. Welcome to the show. This is Category 5 Technology TV. We've got a great one planned for you. Mm-hmm. Jeff, you were away last week. Last two two weeks. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But last week in particular, I'm thinking of because last week we took a Raspberry Pi 3 yes. and we built a Plex server. I was so looking forward to being here, but my family got sick and I had to be home to take care of them. So I uh. loved watching the episode afterwards. Episode 459. Do you remember being here? When we first yes. set up Plex on a Raspberry Pi 3. Yes. It was groundbreaking because the Pi 3 had just come out. And, hey, you can use this as a Plex media server? Mm-hmm. Who has room for this? Do you have room for this on your network? I do. Huh? I went home that night and plugged it in. It was amazing. And have you been using it ever since? Ever since. There you have Always it, on Plex. So what has happened, though, Jeff, as I talked to Sasha about last week... Debian has been updated. Yes. Stretches out. Mm -hmm. Plex Media Server has been updated. It's a new version. It's way better than when we first did it back almost two years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I created what's called Plex Pi. And Plex Pi is a free download at plexpi.com. And tonight, we're in fact going to look at... Now, last week, we showed how to set it up, how to install it. This week, we're going to look at how to use it. Ooh, good times. So we get to see Plex for the first time ever. Now... We have so much stuff around us, so many things in front of us. I've got a stack of DVDs. What I do want you to observe, though, I know it's a little bit difficult right now, but over here, right, see where my hand is behind my monitor? Here is my Raspberry Pi 3 running Plex Pi, and I have simply plugged in a USB flash drive. It's just my standard USB flash drive that I carry in my pocket. It's loaded full of stuff, but I put some videos on it. Okay. Okay. I put some music on it as well, because I mentioned last week, Sasha, that uh, we can put music on our Plex server, right? So, I'm a big fan of UK TV shows. Yes. You got me into UK TV shows so many years ago. Oh, yeah? Yes. Yes. Yep. All right. So, uh, Kelsey and I, as a matter of fact, showed how to copy your DVDs um, onto um, M4V files, like yes. to convert your DVDs into video files. That was a great episode. So I've done that. So I've got, I've got Stella Season 5 and Season 4. Mm-hmm. I've got Trolleyed. I have not heard of that one. Season 3. You are borrowing this, my friend. Oh. Season 4. Okay, so these are just... So I just grabbed four seasons of, um, of my favorite shows here, some of my favorite shows. Becca and I really enjoy the, the UK comedy. Um, and I've got a movie, Sideways, lots of fun. Great movie. Not appropriate for the kids. No. Nope. Um, <laughs> and I've got a Josh Turner CD. Okay. M- music. You remember these guys? I know they're discontinued now. You can't buy them at Target or anything like that. But that's what they looked like. So what I've done is I've just copied, uh, well, I've copied Sideways in, and I've copied a couple of episodes. Whoop. Oh. Throwing discs. There goes one of my seasons. <laughs> I've co- I, all I did was copy a couple of episodes of each of these from the DVD um, using Handbrake. Mm-hmm. So I've got those on that USB flash drive so that we can show you how to set up your library. Good times. All right. Ready to see how it's done? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So in order to do this, you have to have 
Plex Pi 1.2. Not or, 1. or 1. higher, not 1.1, 1. 1 because d- during the first week of release, so Plex 1.1 1. 1 came out last week. Yes. And then during that week, Plex Media Server was updated in such a way that it broke everything. No way. <laughs> really? Can you imagine? Oh. So we've got thousands of downloads happening last week. Right. And so, you know, the forum becomes a buzz with people saying, I can't access my media on the USB oh, flash drive. No. So. Plex one, uh, Plex Pi 1.2 fixes that. Okay, so I've got my laptop in front of me, and um, you'll notice what I'm going to do is everything is going to be done through my web browser. So okay. you can do this by plugging a keyboard and a mouse into your Plex Pi if you want, but you don't have to do that. You can just access it from any of your devices, sit at the comfort of your desk, and do it that way. Um, so I'm going to jump over to our laptop here, okay. and so I know, I believe I know, it's 192.168.0.105 colon 32400 slash web, and if my IP address has not changed, and it has. Fantastic, because we had some problems before the show where uh, we had to restart the router a couple of times and everything else. So let me just grab the uh, IP address. Now, I could do that if I had the Plex Pi plugged into um, an HDMI directly so that I could see the screen. Then I could just go in and type um, IP A. And so see, IP space A. Going headless is how I do it at home as well. Yeah. Because my, I mean, where I've got my Raspberry Pi is way off in, an, in another location near my, um, near my router. Oh, okay. Uh, and then I just, through the network, access it mm-hmm. headlessly. And, and it, it's so much easier to do. Yeah, I love that. any computer I can log in and deal with it. So I could be in the living room on my laptop and... You know. I love as well that uh, you can access it from any device. Yes. My IP has incremented, so it's now 106 is what and my... So I just checked the DHCP pool of my router. I don't know if you knew this. What's maybe that? you did, and if that's the case, maybe you don't know this. But I have accessed my Plex Pi remotely. Oh, yeah. And got well, into the back. But you have a Plex Pass. I now, do have Plex Pass. Keep in mind, that's a commercial thing, so you have to pay yes. extra for that feature. But it was you really can do nice. That. You can do that. But Plex Pi, it's in the um, in the to do list. Yep. You'll see that there is actually a feature coming in an upcoming release that allows you to do that without having to pay for a Plex Pass. Oh, okay. Well, I've I do it now because I've paid for it. But it, it was really nice mm. to be able because I know how to get in through the web. It was nice yeah. to be able to do that remotely because I was sure I'm away for work all the time. Yeah. And my wife called me. And yeah. If you're like, at a hotel and you want to watch, well, your yeah, your watching videos? stuff. But also our Plex went down. And so there was something on the back end that didn't work with one of the files. Yeah. So I was able to remotely log into the actual oh, perfect. nuts and bolts of it yeah, and yeah. adjust it from the hotel oh, room. It was amazing. Brilliant. Okay. Loved it. Well, so you remember last week, Ash and I set this up, and this is what we saw. So in order to get here, all I needed to know was the IP address of my Plex server, which mine had changed to 192.168.0.106. Then you go colon. 32400, that is the port that it is running on, and then slash web. And so I'm actually accessing this through my Raspberry Pi. It then redirects over here to app.plex.tv the first time I run it because it needs me to log in. So if you don't have an account, you can create one. So you would just uh, you would continue however you want to. Um, but if you already have an account, you don't have to create one. Uh, in my case, I already have one, so I'm just going to sign in. So then it's going to let me in. So the very first time that I I run it, this is what I see on my Plex Pi. Okay. I'm just going to make that full screen here so that we don't have the uh, the bar up at the top. So it tells me that Plex Media Server is running uh, on a computer where you put all your media, and then Plex scans your media, automatically organizes it, makes it beautiful, play your media on any screen with the Plex app. Got it. Nice. Now, this is the first time I've ever connected to this particular Plex Plex Pi instance. That is a tongue twister Mm -hmm. if I ever did hear one. Yes. Plex Pi instance. Okay, so it's asking me, do you want to sign up for a Plex Pi? pass. Now, this is where, um, yeah, you can do this for mobile syncing and camera uploads. That's cool. That's a cool feature. Uh, Cloud sync, all that kind of stuff. There's a, there is some great stuff here. Remember, Plex is absolutely free. Yes. Plex Pi is absolutely free. Um, so far, your expense is negligible. Mm-hmm. Uh, Plex Pass is your way of contributing to Plex Media Server. Yes. Not, not to Plex Pi. It's completely now going to Plex. Yes. How much does it cost you per month? Oh, I pay for the lifetime. Exactly. Exactly. 
So I'm so done. You get the lifetime, you just pay for it once, you're done. Yep. So then you get all those features. If you are absolutely opposed to spending any money on this right now and you just want to do it you'll notice there is no option to just go ahead where's the one to do it for free right and it's right up here the x the x so subtle yeah okay so now we're done so what do we want to call our new server i'm just going to call this plex pi or you can name it you know ferguson family server Super happy fun time media. Allow me to access my media outside my home. I'm going to leave that checked, but remember, it's not going to work without a Plex Pass at this point. Right. Next. Now, what it's doing is it's created my profile. Yes. So remember that the only thing that I've done differently from last week, other than upgrading to 1.2, is I have plugged in my USB flash drive. Mm -hmm. I did not have to mount it. I didn't have to set up any FS tab entries, nothing like that. Um, I just simply plugged it in. So now if I go add library, this is my first step. Right now there are no videos known to Plex. Right. So I need to teach it where my files are. Let's start with movies. So these library types are important. Okay. What I'm doing, I'm not telling it I want to call this movies. I'm telling it the, the classification of this is a movie or a TV show or music or my photos or other videos would be like home movies, for example. Right. And that's important to recognize that that is the classification because that is going to control how Plex will interpret the content. Yes. If it's a movie, it will look for the ratings. It will look for the description of the movie on uh, the internet database. It'll mm -hmm. look for the artwork and all that stuff and the description in the movie database. Yes. If it's a TV show, on the other hand, it's going to look for season one, episode one, season two, episode one, season two, episode f two and three and so on. And then it's going to put it into a menu system that is appropriate for television series where you mm -hmm. can select the season, select the episode and push play. If it's a home movie, it then knows that it, because this is other videos it then knows that it's not going to tr find any of that information online right so it generates a thumbnail based on the content of the video and simply names it whatever the file name is mm -hmm. so it's important to, to assign this correctly so we're going to start with movies because i've ripped sideways so i'm going to click on movies and then hit add folders or next. So I'm just going to click add folders and then browse to my media folder and you'll see what my 128 gigabyte external flash drive is already detected. Now that could be a USB hard drive. Mm -hmm. That could be, um, it, that's a great idea. Like having an external hard drive so that it's not being stored on the SD card of your uh, Plex Pi. Yeah. And then that way you can, sh you can safely shut down your Plex Pi, unplug that hard drive, load up more videos. Yep. And then plug it back in, turn it on, you're good to go. It'll automatically detect the new stuff in the library. So I'm going to browse to my 128 gigabyte drive. And you see, like, this is a drive that I use for the show, so it's episodes and everything. But then I've also created a folder called Plex Demo Files. In that folder, I've got a folder called Movies. And so I like to keep my files organized, and it helps me when I add it to Plex. You see that it's detected that there is a video there. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to simply add that. And so you're adding the folder, not the file. That's correct. I'm adding the movies folder on my flash drive. So if I unplug that flash drive, it loses it. Right. It loses access to it. But then I plug it back in and it's back again. Okay? Right. Um, so keep that in mind as well. This drive needs to be always connected to this device if you want to be able to watch these. Um, I can click on add library or I can go advanced. And in advanced, it will say, you know, what, do you, what other options do you want to do? Do you want to show the collection and other items? Do you want to use the Plex Media Scanner? You could probably just click on add library and just leave all these settings as they are, but it's interesting to see what kind of options are available there. I'm going to add library, and it says, okay, it's scanning movies. It's already matched sideways on Plex Pi. See that at the bottom? Downloading metadata for sideways. It's doing that all in the background. I can click on add library and keep doing other things. Let's add our TV shows. And I can name that something else. I could call this, if I wanted to be so organized, I could call it TV shows comedy. And I could have folders that are specifically organized with comedy so that it's more organized for 
for me. So in this case, I'm just going to go TV shows, add folders, browse for media, go to my 128 gig drive, zip down to my Plex demo files, and in there I'm going to go TV shows. It's recognized some folders. So I could click on a folder, but then I'd only get that one show. I want this top level TV shows folder, and I'm going to click add, and then add library. Now it's scanning. Watch what happens at the bottom there. Scanning, matching Stella UK on Plex Pi. And it's going to start downloading the metadata for that. Let's add some music. So I've also ripped um, this CD that I've got here, the Josh Turner CD. Mm -hmm. So let's browse for media, go on to our drive. Again, I like to keep things nice and organized. So I, I don't just have one folder for everything. I've got my music in a folder called music. And then I add that. Now it's going to add some music. What do you want to do? Do you want to create a premium Plex library? Or do you want to just create a normal basic music library, which is what I'm going to do because it's free. And what do I want to do? Include in the dashboard. Yep. Use embedded tags or would it scan it from the internet? That's fine too. And then you've got last FM settings. You can stream this to your devices, all that kind of stuff. Add. Okay. Now I've got some home videos. I, I just saw yeah. as you were closing there, there is a feature that will log where you are in the album. Absolutely. No, that's, that's all. That's neat. Uh, logging I've where you are in the videos, that. where you are in, oh, yeah. I have not At Christmas that. That time with great. our Christmas playlist with thousands of random songs, it's nice that it remembers where you're at. That's a great little feature. Absolutely. Um, and our series, like, if could you imagine having to find where you were yeah, in your series? True. That's so old school. Uh, I'm going to call this folder called Home Videos. And we're going to go Add Folders, Browse for Media, and you'll notice that on my drive, I've also got a folder called Home Videos. Add that. Oh, your wedding. And then add Library. And would you like to see a clip of my wedding? Because it's importing. And when we come back, we're going to see how our Plex Pi looks now that we've imported some of this media. Stick around. Jeff Weston, yeah, man. you're building a brand new, beautiful website. What? Aren't you? No. Am I? Oh, you're a terrible actor. What? This is where acting comes into play. Oh, I didn't know we were acting. You're supposed to act. Okay, fair enough. All right. yeah, I'm building a really cool website. Are you building a really cool website? Just because Jeff is confused doesn't mean you have to be. Visit cat5.tv slash dreamhost to sign up for unlimited web hosting for your website with unlimited email accounts, MySQL databases, the latest version of PHP, WordPress, and more, and even a free domain name registration. It's less than $6 per month, so sign up today. cat5.tv slash dreamhost. <laughs> Welcome back to Category 5 Technology TV. We are going through Plex Pi. Yes. So you have added the files to your library. It's done all the metadata syncing. Well, I, th I assume so. I mean, if we look at our screen here, we've added the libraries. Yep. So I've got movies, TV shows, home videos. And remember, Jeff, these are now, these are stored on my USB flash drive. Yes. So I'm not wearing down the SD card of my Plex uh, server, the, right. the Raspberry Pi. Because an SD card in a Raspberry Pi is, if you use that for video, it's going to wear down real Absolutely. quick. And it's going to crash. And then mm -hmm. you're going to wonder why your Plex Pi server is not working. This way, your media, all the playback is happening there. The only thing that the, um, that the SD card is used for is the operating system, the software, and the library data, like the yes. metadata. Yeah. So saving the image, the artwork, and things like that, and where you are in your video playback. Now, right before we went on break, you teased and said, do you want to see my wedding video? <laughs> well, I, we'll see if it works. I want to see it because I forget how young you looked. Oh, I, I had was, hair, I was, Jeff. I know. I was around then. Like mm. We worked together then, and I'm, I'm intrigued to see how I saw a picture today. Our old employer posted a, yes. a video of their lobby that has pictures from back in the day and back yes, in I saw that. 1999, 2000 area. There's a picture of you and I, and we were kids. Yes. And I had a full head of hair. It was beautiful. <laughs> Did you know? Absolutely do you, the do you remember the time we threw back to an old episode and you had hair and I just lost it? I had, <laughs> never... well, I had, I had clown hair. Yes. I was bald on the top. <laughs> do you know how? This was full hair. Do you know how far back our technology interaction goes? 
Well, when we met, you sent me my very first text message. Did I? It took me two months to find on my phone. I nice. couldn't figure out why I couldn't get rid of the stupid <laughs> voicemail icon. Oh, boy. That was, that was my first cell phone. You sent me a text that day. Fantastic. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, look at that. History and it worked. It all, worked. And now we're here. And we're building servers that fit literally in your pocket. Take that with you. Like when I go to my in-laws and I want to show them all of our new shows or if I'm going yes. away for a holiday, take it with you. Plug yeah. it into the TV at the hotel. It's got all your stuff on it. it. All your shows. It's amazing. It's fantastic. All right, let's get into it. Okay. Plex Pie. What's next? Let's find out. All right. What do you want to do? Do you want to get some Plex apps? We'll get there. Don't worry about it. We're not going to do it just now. Done. What? It's all there. Look at that. Look at this. Oh, and we've got some videos at the bottom there. Our wedding and Berry Hill Farms. And so we've got sideways. Let's see what happens if I click on it. We've got a description. We've got the actors. And if we click on it, it's going to actually search through. What? Push the right buttons. It helps. <laughs> if I click on the actors, it's going to instantly search through my library and find other videos with those actors in it. So if I like one of the actors, I can click on it and boom, there's a list of all the videos. Now, I've only imported one movie, so there's not going to be any Paul Giamatti in there, but there you have it. So it shows me the length of it. It shows me, see the Rotten Tomatoes score up here. Uh, it shows me the, uh, th that it's in the drama comedy um, uh, category got the description and everything else and i can actually rate it and i can click here to say how many stars i give it so how cool is that all right so if i go on the left hand panel here now jeff yep. see how easy this was to set up it's crazy so i've got tv shows i've got music i've got movies and remember folks that, like this takes up a fair bit more space these are, this is exactly what's on my Plex server right now. It takes up a fair bit more space than this mm -hmm. with a USB flash drive added to it. This is exactly what's on my Plex server right now. And there you go. So let's click on music and see what happens with our Josh Turner CD. So now you see it's playing down there at the bottom. Oh, look at that. And I think it's playing, it's playing out of my speakers um, locally. Right. So my laptop, it's playing out of my laptop speakers. Because that's where you're loading it from, though. Right. So we, we tend to think, well, if I push play, it's going to play out of the Pi. So it needs to be hooked up to a TV. And no, no, it's the device that you are on. So my laptop right now is what is streaming it to those speakers. If mm -hmm. I want to stream it on my phone with a pair of Bluetooth headphones, I can do that. And I can be listening to my music library that way. Or if you're like me at home, you've got your... Uh, a Roku yes. is hooked up with the Plex app. And you've so, got Plex installed on that? Yeah. So oh, that's fantastic. That. So we can listen to our music all the time on our TV. Wonderful. Play through the sound system. It's great. All right. So let's take a look at So if I actually click on the CD rather than pressing play, yep. it gives me a, a track list. It shows me what all is here. Let's see how this... That is cool. What's this? Josh Turner on tour. It even shows me his tour dates. How amazing is that? Oh, and I've got to bring up the screen, don't I? Oh, oh that's why. There, that's okay. Boom. There we go. Don't that. worry, folks. Uh, I'm just on the Josh Turner CD, and it shows me his tour dates. March 4th. And oh, today, that's awesome. And today it is, uh, what, the end of February. So it's, yeah, it's that's February cool. Wow. So it shows me, again, uh, a bit of a description. Uh, and the song list, everything else, and I can click and I guess I can create playlists based on this. Play. And it starts playing down at the bottom here. And it's going to keep doing it as I navigate. Like if I have it playing and then I click on home movies, it's still playing. Oh, look at that. Okay. So keep that in mind too. So here's my home videos. And you'll notice that what it's done is it's created thumbnails based on the videos themselves. So let's click on my wedding and it is simply called our wedding. Right. So, and it, the date of the file is 2013. That's because that's when the file, I guess, was created. It's not actually 2013. It was uh, 20, uh, 2001 when we got married. Um, so if I push play here, oh, it's yeah. got a little window down here and I can click on that. There you go. So look at us. 
Look at my hair. Oh, my goodness. I know, right? Oh, and I was singing. I was even singing. Nice. Rocking it at my own wedding. Uh, oh, there I am. This is back before the days of HD cameras, folks. Yeah. So they, they didn't have HD back then. So that's why I look like a raccoon. <laughs> wow, you're so young. I know, right? Okay. Back in home movies. Again, I can mark things as watched, but notice at the bottom of that video, it shows that we've watched almost halfway. Right, because you, yeah. Because I pushed play and that's where I skipped to. Uh, so if I push play now, it's going to pick up right oh, where I left or, off or awesome. start from beginning. So I can actually click there and it will continue right there. All oh right. my goodness, you're so young. I know, I was just adorable. Aww. <laughs> let's jump back into TV shows, and let's see how this looks. In Stella. Now, again, I only ripped two episodes of each, season, uh, each series because uh, I didn't have the time to rip the whole uh, discs. But there you go. So you can see how it puts it all together. And if I click on it, it even gives me a description of that the episode. Episodes. Wow. Okay. So again, I'm in TV shows. I can click on trolleyed, then it shows me the season. And remember, I had season three on disc, so that's the one that I, I ripped two episodes from. And if I click on it, now I've got the episodes. Episode one, episode two. If I click on one of the episodes, I can see a description of the episode. That's awesome. How cool. And then hit play, and instantly it starts playing. Now, remember here that... It's not playing from the Raspberry Pi. It's playing on my laptop. Right. And it's like, boom, 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 lickety split. So can the Plex Pi handle HD video? I mean, this is, yeah. this is not quite, you know, 4K video. Uh, throw some 4K video and see how it does. It does. Have you done it? I've, yeah, I've got some at home. Yeah? It's amazing. And it does it. Fantastic. So good. Uh, how many devices can you have access in the video simultaneously? That's a question that we get quite a bit. Uh, I'm trying to think how many I've had all at once. I think you've maxed it out though. Like you've seen the buffering or yeah, I think the most I've had is three. And is it a problem? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. I mean, where we had our daughter watching, uh, some, my little pony or something like that. I was watching uh, one of my movies on the my computer. little pony. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was watching my little pony. <laughs> and, uh, and then my wife was, was watching a show, uh, on our other TV mm. uh, that we're accessing through the PlayStation and, it was great. Cool. Yeah, no issues. That's another thing to mention, too. I mean, Netflix, you have to pay for extra devices. Yes. I think it starts with, like, three, and then if you want more than that, what? you have to pay. Is it one? It's one. It's one now. Wow. Um, so you have to pay more to get access to it on more devices. With Plex, I don't think there's a limit. No. I've never, like, I've never encountered it. Essentially, I mean, the limitation we have at home is based on our bandwidth. Hmm. Like, just how much can our router handle? I mean, really, I mean, yeah. our entire house is all hooked up. It's every, everything. <laughs> yeah, and that's an Internet. interesting point, too, because um, the Raspberry Pi 3 has Wi-Fi. So the temptation yeah. may be Don't. to use Wi-Fi to, to run it. Your Plex Pi server should be connected directly to Ethernet. Yep. Now, it may not even be your router, but it could be the Ethernet port of the Raspberry Pi being that it is only a 100 megabit port. Yeah, that's true. So that's a limitation of the Raspberry Pi. I don't, I don't know that that's going to be a problem, though. No, this has worked so. for you for years. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, Fantastic. ever since that episode. So, I mean, it's been two years. Yeah. So, and a lot of our movies that we have that we've ripped from our Blu-ray and whatnot, they're okay. much higher quality. Oh, yeah. I'm ripping DVDs. So they're right. uh, 480p. Um, some of them came in at 720p. I don't know if that was just the settings I had or yeah, it if it's be. legit. I but, I mean, we've got some big files. Like, some of our movies are, like, 10 gigs. Like, so they're massive. Right. And just, they're playing on your Pi? They're playing on the Pi, no problem. Nice. And even with the downgrading, because, our, like, our TV is only 720. Transcoding. Yes. So, like, it looks still looks great. Right. So understand, that's another feature of PlexPi, and it's because of Plex Media Server, but yes. your PlexPi server will do this. So you've got your Raspberry Pi, you stick a 4K video on there, and you think, well, I don't have a 4K TV, so this is a problem. It's not, because what happens is, is your PlexPi server um, transcodes it on the fly. So it instantly changes the resolution of the file and makes it so that it plays properly on your device without yep. having to change settings. Now, the other neat thing about that is it also um, it changes um, the format of the file. Yes. You mentioned um, a, a Roku. Yes. Roku will not play, for example, MP4 files natively. 
Correct. You might be able to play an MP4 file on your phone if you imported it and had it on your internal SD card, and then you open the file. It will play, yes. but a Roku will not. Other devices have their idiosyncrasies with regards to file formats. The Plex Pi will automatically stream it to any device. doesn't mm-hmm. matter what format it is. So right. if it's an MKV, if it's an MP4, AVI, um, some of our old family videos are probably going to be AVIs and things like that. So uh, it takes care of all that for you. Now, one thing that I really loved about Plex mm-hmm. is it, it works like the middleman, so to speak. We used to have all of our like the movies that we had ripped and all that were on our hard drive when we were playing them through the PlayStation. There was an update right. to the PlayStation software oh, yeah. a while ago, yep. uh, six years ago maybe, mm-hmm. a while. It, it, <laughs> it would no longer play those videos because they weren't, it wasn't, however I was, I ripped oh. it, didn't have some sort of signature. And so this, in an effort to prevent piracy, Oh, would dear. play them. Okay. So I was like, oh. So we started looking at other options. We got a Western Digital, and yep. the same thing happened there. So when we went to the Roku and we used Plex, because it's running through the app, all of our files now play on the PlayStation because Roku, or the know. Plex acts as the middleman. Right. So it made our PlayStation accessible. Isn't it interesting that this makes your old PlayStation work again? Yeah. This makes your current devices future ready because even if a, a, a firmware update changes things, this will continue to stream to your device. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. I love cool. it. Uh, is there anything else that, uh, that I should be showing here, Jeff? I think this kind of covers uh, a good little run through of it all. how Plex works. So um, it's pretty straightforward. It automatically checks for updates and does all that. Um, we can check out the one final thing that I'd like to do with our Plex server here is actually get onto our website, category5.tv, and scroll way down to the very, very bottom. You know that's where you'll find the button that says subscribe. And there's Plex. So get our Plex plugin, and when I click on that, it takes me to this page and it gives me some information about how to do it. All right, so we need to download this file. Okay. Boom. Can I just copy it? Is there a way to have oh, you ever yeah. installed have you ever installed a plugin just directly in Plex? Uh, channels. The channels, yes. I don't install channels. I don't channels. think I installed the category five channel this way. Okay. All available plugins. It'll be nice once Category 5 is an official Plex plugin because right. then it'll be available for us just by searching in Plex. For now, you've got to do it this way. So you would, uh, you would download it, extract it. Uh, we don't have enough time tonight to go through it, but I'd encourage you to get over there um, to our website, category5.tv. Click on um, to, uh, to the subscribe icon at the bottom and then get the Plex plugin, and it's really, really straightforward. So you just need to download that zip file, unzip it, rename the folder, move it to your Plex Media Server's plugin folder, which I can do, again, by simply copying it over to my USB flash drive, and just follow the prompts there, uh, launch with the channels button, and boom, you're done and done. I'd love to have the time to show you, but uh, it's it's really quite simple. Yeah. Uh, and that is because Plex also supports the channel architecture, so you can add um, shows like Category 5 TV without ever having to download the shows. Mm-hmm. Um, so it streams just the episodes that you want to see. And again, once that channel is added to your Plex Pi server, it is accessible on all of your devices. Yes. So yeah. easy peasy, nice and simple. I love that program. Yeah. <laughs> it's a life changer. It really is. Um, I, lo- I love things like Netflix, but um, having it on my own kind of server and being able to control the media um, is, yes. is brilliant. Yeah. So, and the kids love it. The kids absolutely they love do. it. They do. And they know how to use it so well. It's, like it's really too easy. easy to use. Too easy, folks. You can download the uh, Raspberry Pi image. It's absolutely free. Cat5.tv. No, pardon me. Uh, PlexPi.com. I forgot we got the, the .com. How cool oh, is that? that? PlexPi.com. Download the, uh, the image from there, and uh, you'll be able to install that on a, an SD card and boot it up, and you'll be up and going with Plex, just like you saw tonight. Uh, but do watch for uh, version 1.2 or higher. Yeah. So if you're only seeing 1.1, just wait. We're just uploading 1.2, um, so it'll be ready this weekend. 
Good times. All right. Sasha Rickman. How are you, my friend? I am great. She is here. All now, the way over we're here. On, yeah, we're on different sets tonight, and yes. we're not using the green screen, so we can't fake it. Um, but this is like we're on multiple cameras, and this, we are in the same room here. This is a throwback to what, season six, five or six? All kinds of seasons we had we, we setups had... like this, and yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so, are, you, uh, are you feeling like uh, you want to head on over to the newsroom? Is that, is that kind of where you're... Feeling like you want to take the <laughs> do show? Do you want to know the honest truth? I really do. After all this waiting, I feel like I could head to the loo quick. You actually, <laughs> you actually said that on live TV. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and but so when, when we come back, <laughs> so you realize you could have done your intro, paused during the commercial to run to the loo. No, I didn't. That would have been I've something like that we could have done <laughs> in hindsight, you know, just I'm because you only I'm read four things and then we say, we'll be back after I this. how remember much time that. you're taking right now. You remember how that works, <laughs> okay. right? Just Watch how this happens, folks. Ready? Take it away. <laughs> it's all you, Sash. All right. Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category5.tv newsroom. A startup in the UK is making huge waves by lowering the cost of robotic prosthesis using 3D printing technology. A California electronics recycler is fighting to stay out of jail after he admitted to copying thousands of Windows reinstallation disks to use with refurbished PCs. AI researchers at Google have developed algorithms that can assess the risk of heart attacks by analyzing retinal scans. A clock designed to run for 10,000 years is under construction. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. Whether you shop on ThinkGeek, GearBest, B&H Photo Video, eBay, or Amazon, or even if you want a free trial of Audible, you'll find the best deals and support the shows we produce by simply visiting the shopping sites you already frequent by using the links on our website. Visit category5.tv slash partners for the full and ever-growing list and help us create more free content like this show. Thank you for shopping with our partners and thank you for watching. This is the Category5.tv newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman and here are the top stories we're following this week. A UK startup is changing the way we see prosthesis. Open Bionics is working hard to create affordable 3D printed bionic hands that actually work, but are about 30 times cheaper than other prosthesis on the market. They operate using sensors attached to the skin to detect muscle movements. The muscle movements control the hand and open and close fingers. Open Bionics teamed up with the National Health Service in the UK and has been trialing their bionic hands with children as young as eight. Right now, the NHS spends approximately $75 million per year on prosthetic services. Young children often don't have access to these devices because they're not small enough or they're just too expensive. So, for example, their parents can't afford to supply them or the NHS cannot afford to supply the patient with it. The co-founder of the company says seeing a young child being able to move fingers individually for the first time is really cool. Open Bionics is currently working on arms that are straight out of the science fiction universe. Themes from Marvel, Disney, and Star Wars, Star Wars tr franchises are available. The goal is to make kids feel proud of their prosthesis. This changes the image of prosthesis from a medical device to bionic arms inspired by famous characters. Currently, the arms take roughly 40 hours to 3D print. The person's limb is scanned with a tablet, then the design of the prosthetic is then planned out. Finally, the prosthetic is 3D printed. A royalty-free agreement has been formed between Disney and Open Bionics. This means themed designs have even more potential. The company sees a future of making prosthesis fashionable and accessible to all. This is one of those really great stories, especially if you know somebody who has had either an amputation or is born with only one limb and you think to yourself, okay, now it can be 
like a, it's it can be like a conversation starter, a trendsetter. Oh yeah. But my question to you, Robbie, and you might yeah. know the answer to this, sure. is if you're three D printing something, like do you three D print the electric? components? Are you 3D printing rubber? What are you doing? Oh, I got you. Okay. So um, what's really neat um, about what they're doing, let's see if I can bring them up. I'm just doing a quick search for Open Bionics. Uh, it takes us to openbionics.com. They've got some really cool stuff there. Um, I'm going to show you this, folks. Like This is the kind of stuff that Sash is talking about. Can you imagine as a kid how <laughs> outstanding that would be? Oh my goodness. Like, come on. They've made it cool. Um, but what, what they have is you can actually download um, blueprints and things like that to, to 3D print it yourself, Sasha. But so here's the thing. So they've got a shop where you can buy the, uh, the components. Like th this is the tendon line here, for example. And you may not know what that is, but you will in just a moment. They've got actuators that you can buy as well so that you can, you can set it all up. They even have gel fingertip grips so that it gives you better grip on things and all the needed screws and things like that. So the things that you can't 3D print, you can buy directly from Open Bionics. But as the name suggests, being that they are open, they really have made it an open platform so that you can get a hold of the 3D printing diagrams and print it yourself. Mm -hmm. So then you only have to buy the components that you can't 3D print. I think so, this is such a neat idea. Yeah. So there's the uh, muscle sensor, for example, and the electrodes that, um, that make it work. And you can, if you don't have a 3D printer, you can go ahead and buy a bionic hand already made. Um, and if you look really, really closely, I said you'd be able to tell where those tensors go. Do you see in between the finger joints? Yeah. That's where the tensors are. So the, the actuators pull on that string and make the hand uh, actually operate. Okay. How cool is that, right? Uh, but I making it this. so that it looks like um, Iron Man, for example. And a kid that could have that and be... Like that. Exactly. It just totally changes things, and I love well, that. And the thing is, the reason I think a lot of parents um, in the past with the, the cost, uh, with it being so prohibitive because yeah. kids grow and they change so much, but if you can bring the cost down, then as kids grow, they can go through different things. Themes, right? Like I remember with my sisters when they had braces, they were excited about choosing their braces colors, right? Yeah. You can actually change what your arm looks like really as you grow. And then you can, you, so you can do a Disney theme and then you can grow into a more adult version later. Oh, really? Like Iron Man. Can I show you one more thing, Sasha? Yeah. <laughs> I, I need to show you this. A search in Google for Open Bionics ADA, A-D-A gives you uh, a list. There's the, uh, the circuit controller, like the controller itself that they manufacture and sell. It looks a lot like an Arduino to me. Um, and all the stuff here. So you can see how they've actually laid this out so that people can get in there. Hey, here's how to Here's how to print it yourself. Here's how to, you know, you can get the, here's how to insert the actuators. Here's how to put it all together. Here's wow. how to install. Like the instructions are right on their website. This is the future. I, I just am blown away. I mean, look at how much detail they've given us here. Yeah, it is Arduino. They've, they're showing you how to install the Arduino uh, uh, software there. And look how slick the presentation is. Like, it's, oh, yeah. it's not clunky in any way. Like, it's very clean. Beautiful. There's how to set up the, uh, the tendons. Huh. Just unreal, folks. And this is what... So if you were to 3D print it yourself, there you have it. That's what it would look like. Not quite as beautiful as the ones that they do themselves because uh, they probably have much better 3D printers than a home person does. Right. But, uh, and, and it's neat too, Sasha, that you can get into, uh, talk to your local library. A lot of libraries, public libraries these days have 3D printers for public use. Really? You can download the blueprints for this and take it to the library to print it. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, our library here in Barrie has a 3D printer. What? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So check into it. I love when news stories are this like mind-blowingly awesome. This is a great one. Yeah. A California electronics recycler is fighting to stay 
out of jail after he admitted to copying thousands of Windows reinstallation disks to use with refurbished PCs. As an e-waste warrior, Eric Lundgren wished to see discarded computers fixed up and reused rather than crammed into the holes in the ground. To encourage people to refurbish and, con and continue using unwanted Dell PCs, he burned and distributed 28,000 copies of the IT giant's Windows XP and 7 restore disks. These disks can be used to wipe clean a machine's storage and reinstall a fresh copy of Microsoft's operating system. Well, U.S. prosecutors weren't impressed by this caper. Lundgren was taken to court, and in May of last year, he pleaded guilty to conspiracy to traffic in counterfeit goods and criminal copyright infringement. At the time, the 33-year-old Rosetta, California resident was sentenced to 15 months in jail and fined $50,000. His co-conspirator, Robert J. Wolf of Boca Raton, Florida, at the time was 54 and was placed under six months of house arrest and given four years probation. But the district court granted Lundgren a stay of sentence, allowing him to challenge the punishment without a trip to the clink. Is this fair, though? The computers he created... The computers he created the disks for had valid Windows license keys. The disks were, in one sense, cleaning tools for wiping a machine and preparing it for reuse rather than depriving, a, uh, depriving Microsoft of a Windows sale. It was the value of those disks, however, that were used as the basis for the 15-month term. After all, Dell offers its reinstallation media for free from its website, while Microsoft typically charges for copies of its operating system. Arguing that a copy of Windows is essentially useless without a product key and that all of the recycled machines had their own valid keys, Ludgren's lawyers suggested that what he did was merely make it easier for the owners to get something that they already were entitled to for free. Wow. So, in my opinion, this was not even illegal. This is not worth... <laughs> a, I don't think that's worth a charge. What do you think? Okay, I... I read this story and I tried to wrap my mind around it because I get what he's doing. I get the copyright laws. I'm inclined to agree with you. I don't think what he was doing was illegal. I think, and again, I'm not a legal professional. This is just my layman's perspective, but I think he got caught in a loophole. I don't think it was necessarily intended for this. Is it a loophole or is it the court's not understanding the legitimacy of licensing versus media? Well, th that could, yeah, that's probably a better way. They, they don't, not understanding how it works. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's not like he was doing it from a piracy standpoint. I mean, this stuff is already, it was already accessible. It was already available. For yeah. That's such a gray area, though, eh? It is. Because the media itself has the software, but you can't activate it without a valid license key. And the license key is valid. So is it legal? Is it illegal? <sighs> I think it technically is illegal. I, I suppose to a, in a technical sense, I mean, I guess, I guess maybe it is. But I, I don't see that it was done as an illegal act. I don't see that it was done maliciously. Yeah, that's not a... Come on, you... you no, I, 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 that's not I, a, I know. Ignorance, well, I didn't. ignorance is not innocent. No. However, yeah. this, this, was, this was a kindness, right? This is saving the environment, right? Other than this, these computers would be trash, right? right. So isn't this yeah. like an act of mm -hmm. earthly kindness? Is that is that like a court <laughs> argument? This was an act of earthly kindness. No, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's not like it was... It wasn't stealing. It was. I mean, the the, the <clears throat> keys were right there. I mean, sure. you've got the the sticker on the case. I know. <sighs> so, had he just refurbished these computers and sold them without the media, would he have been cool? Probably, because they're getting them on the media. I I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess at the end of the day, if a portion of the sale was converted as, you know third party whatever if and it's checked for the media yeah then I, would that have then made it now legal who knows like it's, anybody know comment below here's the only crime that i see here is that he didn't install linux on those computers yes i agree sustained <laughs>
Artificial intelligence researchers at Google have developed algorithms that can assess the risk of heart attacks by analyzing retinal scans. By looking for common patterns in images of retinal scans and matching them up with data in the patient's medical records, one algorithm could determine if someone was a smoker or a non-smoker to an accuracy of 71%. Another algorithm that was focused on the blood vessels in the eye could tell if somebody had severe high blood pressure or not, a sign associated with increased chances of stroke. Their models can also predict other factors such as age, gender, and the chance of a heart attack or stroke. Lily Pang, a product manager at Google Brain, explained, given the retinal image of one patient who up to five years later experienced a major cardiovascular event such as a heart attack, and the image of another patient who did not, our algorithm could pick out the patient who had the cardiovascular event 70% of the time. Wow. While 70% may not seem as accurate as you'd want, according to the researchers at the l According to the researchers, the level of accuracy is actually very similar to the more traditional method of drying blood to measure cholesterol levels. Huh. So this is really good as far as advancement in helping to self-diagnose things before you have to take the extra step. Right? Witchcraft. <laughs> It reminds me of that. You remember, you know, if you look to the left, you're lying. Yeah. You know, or whatever yeah. that was. Uh, yes, that's right. But to think 70% accuracy, that's, uh, that's kind of surprising. I, I may have missed it in the story, but how many times did they run this test? Like what? More than once. Okay. <laughs> but we don't Three know. Three or four. Well, like wh what quantifies 70% accuracy? Was there 10 yeah, tests sure. and seven of them got right? Was it 10,000 tests? This is what we don't know, Jeff. You let's, know, just assume, let's just assume that this was a very thorough, very scientific test. It right? has to and be. This, before before right? any scientist is going to release a paper, it's going to be thoroughly examined, thoroughly tested. Right. So now let's think about all of the ways that this could either help us or not. Because I'm thinking about retinal scans of the future when all of a sudden you're denied access to a country because you might have a stroke while you're there. <laughs> okay. I, I already have a fear of AI looking me in the eye and saying, you are going to die. Soon. Okay. So I, I, have, I, I agree with Sasha on this one. Okay. I think the more we use technology to automatically assert a health condition, um, it opens the door to discrimination. And I, I mean, I'm not going to get into a whole... Are you saying that to know that you are going to have a condition is to discriminate? So, uh, no, uh, not to know, but to take that information and bar you from something. Like, imagine you go to sign up for insurance. Yeah. You know, you want to get health insurance and your insurance provider comes to you and says, hey, can you just take a look at this little box here? <laughs> and we go, just put oh, this up by the way, mind. we've determined that even though you've not been diagnosed, you've had X, Y, Z happen. And now because of that, your premiums are this. Under, like, like, we're talking right. about making assumptions based on an imperfect system. 70% is great, but it's not a perfect system 100% of the time. How did this become that? Sasha, what do you think? How did this become that? Because is this not, this is I would like to know if I'm going to come down with this problem right so this is perfect in the hands of the user this is really great in yeah. the way my fitbit tells me my heart rate and if my heart rate went off the charts i would think okay something's wrong with me same with this retinal scan if all of a sudden it, it flagged something i would think okay i need to get myself to a doctor now that being said as long as it's in my hands and my control it's great and once it goes into the hands of somebody making it discreet discriminatory judgment against my health, that's where it's an issue. I would like to hear from someone who has a condition where they are having to check their cholesterol like that, um, right. where you're having to take the prick test on a recurring basis. How much does that cost you? Is it, is it cost prohibitive in some cases? And would it be better if you could just go to the local pharmacy, look into a machine and have it report back your results just by a retina scan? Yeah, see, that still freaks me out. But see, okay, this is regularly telling people you're going to die because they go, my nose is running. 
Google what's oh, yeah. wrong. Don't ever. You're gonna die. Medication. Yeah. Like I have a headache. <laughs> it could be cancer. <laughs> or an aneurysm. Right. Well, yeah, or an, an aneurysm. Don't say aneurysm when someone has a headache. <laughs> exactly. Especially if it's a migraine, it's just not a good idea. There's somebody who you know is gonna scan and be like, <gasps> Don't ever do it, folks. Google is not a doctor. <laughs> Yeah. But Somebody's it actually it is really, like, it's a cool technology if oh, they yeah. can scan your retina and they can tell you, like, they can tell just by your retina if you're male or female, if you're a smoker or non-smoker, if you're about to have a stroke or not, or if you're lying, if you look a little to the left. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, right. boy. A clock designed to run for 10 millennia without human intervention is now under construction. The 10,000-year clock is a project of the Long Now Foundation, a nonprofit organization that wants to make long-term thinking more common. It's being built on property owned by Amazon founder Jeff Bezos beneath a mountain in the middle of the desert in Texas. There is currently no completion date scheduled for the project. The clock's creator, American inventor Danny Hillis, first publicly shared the concept in an essay for Wired in 1995. In it, he describes his vision of a timepiece that ticks once every year, with a century hand that moves just once every 100 years, and a cuckoo that emerges Every, emerges every 1,000 years. The clock is designed to capture energy from changes in temperature to power its timekeeping apparatus, according to the Long Now Foundation. But it will not be able to store enough energy to display the time unless visitors wind it with a hand-turned wheel. The project has attracted the support of influential artists and thinkers in addition to Bezos, whose contribution of $42 million makes him the largest financial backer. British musician Brian Eno, a famous for his ambient compositions, has built a mechanical melody generator that will produce a different chime sequence every day for 10,000 years. Like the clock hands, the chimes will only work if visitors power the clock. The first prototype of the clock, which was completed back in 1999, is now on display at the Science Museum in London. According to the Long Now Foundation, visitors will be able to hike to the site to see the finished product. Wow. That is neat. That's cool. <laughs> um, so the cuckoo only happens every thousand years? Yes. What, what's to say it's going to work? And what's to say anyone is ever going to remember what it's supposed to do? Well, right. Or what's this? <laughs> like, what? There's had a to, lot of what's to say, <clears throat> right? Yeah. It's art, though. I had to search for this uh, the, uh, Brian Eno because uh, I was curious about who he was. And uh, to think that he's created a, a, melody, a melodic mechanism to add to this clock so that it chimes and stuff. That's cool. If I was I, thinking of the guy who did the uh, the marbles and played music by having the marbles drop down. If I was this guy, I would not do a different tone or melody for every day of the 10,000 years because nobody lives that long and nobody's going to record it and pass that down. Yeah. You could just loop it, right? You just need a different one for every like... Every thousand years, it, ch it just goes back to the first song. Exactly. Like, <laughs> That's all you need to do. It's a really long playlist. Yeah. Uh, so... Okay. Okay, I feel like the obvious question is not being asked, so I'm going to ask it. Why? Why? Right. The other obvious one is $42 million as the biggest financial backing. Exactly. Right? Okay, this, okay. Is, this is a lot of money for a thing underground. Well, why do we need this? Okay, hold I on. Have you ever heard of the Antikythera mechanism? Like, come on. Could you imagine... 10,000 years from now, finding this clock and it still works and seeing the technology from 2018 and how people were able to come together and manufacture this thing. I have no idea what we're going to have in 10,000 years. 10,000 years, we're going to be living on other planets potentially. But like we've, the world is falling apart. Like this past week, we've had the Arctic is warmer than parts of Europe. So don't you want a clock to still be here when there is no civilization left? To read time? Like, what? why? So the space aliens know that we were an intelligent why? race. Why? I, I just can... explained it to you. It's, no, no, it... no, you gave me some cockamamie idea. It's so the aliens why? know that there was an intelligent race here 10,000 years ago. It's... But we... 
we we if okay. it's neat that is why it's really neat and oh. the fact that visitors have to wind it to power it means not only do they have this really neat thing that somebody is obviously paying a lot of money for oh yeah yeah but it means that they'll generate revenue because there'll be tourists who want to go sure, wind this yeah. clock and hear the tone Think and about take a that video for with a it. And then, who knows? Like every thousand years, starting when, which means that there'll be people people camped out like they do, like at the casino for the slot machines, trying to wait for the cuckoo every thousand years. <laughs> Not every thousand years. They're and just look, hoping they're getting one. And look, if you're Jeff Bezos, because you can. Yeah. Because you can. See, and that's the most sensible answer that I have heard. There you go. Because you can. But uh, mm, I'm just don't con- try to figure out art. You know what? I think that's my problem. I don't understand art. I really don't. Just appreciate I, I have a very literal mind. And so, like, I don't understand <laughs> Picasso. I, I, you know, somebody like, puts a pencil on a table and they go, it's expressive. I, I, don't, I don't get it. No, that's a writing tool. So It's I, a clock. I, it's a <laughs> clock. That's all. It's just, it's not even, it's barely art. It's just a clock that moves really slow for a very long time. Ugh. It's like, what is time, right? Maybe that clock is moving very fast See, to I, some beings. I think the problem is he's just making too much money. He doesn't know what to do with it. Sure, I, I will take a little bit of that money. You know what? We will build... A Raspberry Pi clock. You give us that forty million dollars. Can I just as we as the story comes to a close? Can I just put a different spin on it and say, hope for the future. To think that ten thousand years from now, human beings in whatever state that they happen to be in ten thousand years from now are going to observe this art piece and say, wow. To think, so here in 2018, that we're looking forward to 10,000 years in the future and saying, we will still exist, we will be prosperous, we will rule the world 10,000 years from now, and someone will observe this and say, wow. You know what will be even cooler? If in 10,000 years from now, in a cave in the middle of the desert of Texas is actually under an ocean. That would be neat because the world could change by then. We've sure. been shifting like crazy and we might still continue shifting. Uh, you know, I hope that wherever it is that they put this thing, something happens in like the first year and it gets like completely unutilized. So I could just laugh and say, why? Why? Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. Sasha, thank you so much. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to the show. What say ye? We pay a little visit to our biggest fans on YouTube. Oh, the biggest fans. fans because they take the time to comment thank you for your comments timothy hill says this is the worst tech demo i've ever seen i don't ever leave comments but everything about this video seems like bs and, and which video is this i you know what jeff I, i'd rather just move along okay i was feeling really really good tonight i was feeling really really good tonight jafar Hatam, hatami would like to share with us Guy in the center needs to chill out. What guy in the center? I'm usually in the center, aren't I? Well, tonight you're not, so I am, who are you talking about? I am, I've been called hyperactive, and I've been called worse. You know, I will say, we did have one of our biggest fans who made the comment that I'm always saying nice. Yes. I, I'm purposefully trying to not say nice. This is the, the, you're making an effort. I'm making Thanks an to effort to please fans. our biggest fans. Fine, Jeff. I will make an effort to chill out. All right. Don Pierce says, I can see you peddling snake oil from a covered wagon. Sometimes you just want to walk away. <laughs> Sorry, wh- what? 
I'm chill. I'm cool, my baby. <laughs> Headleys. Uh, I show stuff on a show. I have cool <laughs> stuff around me that I want to show you. Hey, check out the Raspberry Pi 3. Snake oil. Uh, clearly, he doesn't understand that I'm also chill. when people purchase through our partner links, we get the show paid for. So, sure. There, 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 there is a benefit, but really? But it really comes down to I love to share cool things with my viewers. And that's part of what Category 5 has always been about is yes. um, as I learn things, I'm excited about it. I know I need to chill, but I get excited. I am so excited right now about cryptocurrency. I know. Because I'm learning all about it. And I can't wait to not be chill and totally go berserk that guy in the middle and show you all that I've learned. And you should. Um, our uh, one of our channels, LinuxTechShow.com on YouTube, uh, hit well over ten thousand subscribers this month. Nice. Thank you so much for subscribing. Uh, along with that, we've received your comments uh, of everyone who is our biggest fan on YouTube, uh, and Alan Wong in particular uh, wanted to reach out to us as we hit that ten thousand subscriber yes. mark and just let us know. It useless is channel. Useless. Useless channel. No information given and a waste of time to watch huh. it. Watch it. Hmm. No information. Okay. I thank you for your subscription because, you know, the numbers are great. But maybe it's not for you. Johnny Snapcaster says, feels like a show from the 90s. <laughs> What? Really? Nice. Maybe wow. it's because we're so young looking. We, we look are... like we're in the 90s. Oh, uh, yeah. We're totally hip. Totally hip. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I need like a curly hair afro kind of thing going on. You know, I, just like a 90s one. I'm just probably going to pull out like the uh, the sweatpants and like a oh, absolutely. Plaid, plaid shirt. That's that's you know. how we roll. Mm -hmm. uh, time for a couple of more of our biggest fans on YouTube. Horst Schlemmer. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I got that everywhere. <laughs> yes, you um, did. Says 20 times the since. No, sorry. Size. The size. 20. I, I, I didn't mean to mispronounce. I'm sorry. <laughs> 20 times the size of a Raspberry Pi 3. Go home. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh. And I guess that's all the time that we have. Wow. For our biggest fans. Uh, maybe one more. How about Paul P. Jer, who says, So awesome, I can just pop one in my pocket and bring it over to a friend's out to play old games. Oh, wait, bald turd. <laughs> bald turd. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for your comments, everybody. Our biggest fans on YouTube, we appreciate you very, very much. We appreciate everybody who subscribes to us on YouTube. We love that you watch the show. And uh, those of you who really do appreciate what we do, we appreciate you even more. Thank you for tuning in. I feel like we have a new challenge. We need to get you at number one Google search for bald turd. <laughs> bald turd. <laughs> we need to get there. <laughs> well, that's all the time that we have for this week. Yes. Um, we had all kinds of technical difficulties off the top of the show yes. uh, before we came on the air. And so, you know, I think we, we kind of pulled it off. And I hope that you enjoyed the Plex Pi stuff, the segment itself. And I hope that you'll check that out. Get yourself a Raspberry Pi. You can pick them up at cat5.tv slash pi. I know I'm just pushing snake oil. But... Uh, I want you to have one. And hey, if you're going to buy it anyways, you may as well do it through our links and it helps us out as well. So we appreciate that. Thanks, Bald Turd. Yeah, no problem. I need one for you. I'm a nice guy. Jeff, nice guy. <laughs> nice guy. <laughs> so have a fantastic week, everybody. We'll see you, Sasha, oh over there in the newsroom. See you, buddy. Bye, everybody. Take care. Night. Bye. Bye.